And President-elect Donald Trump's new White House administration is taking shape fast. Trump making some key picks in the last 48 hours. You can see uh, these are all fierce Trump loyalists, a late-breaking one coming down in the last few minutes. Trump announcing his nominee for Secretary of Defense, Pete Hegseth, a Fox News Channel host, the president-elect calling Hegseth a, quote, true believer in America first, adding that he used his platform at Fox News to, quote, fight for our military and our veterans. And that's not all. The president-elect also announcing a new department altogether, the Department of Government Efficiency. And he says that this one will be led by Tesla CEO Elon Musk and Trump's former political rival turned loyalist Vivek Ramaswamy. Trump issuing a statement saying the pair will pave the way for my administration to dismantle government bureaucracy slash excess regulations, cut wasteful expenditures, and restructure federal agencies. Also, in the last few minutes, Trump officially tapping Republican Governor Kristi Noem for DHS Secretary. Lots to get into here. Let's bring in NBC News resident Trump expert Vaughn Hilliard. Uh, Vaughn, let's start with the Department of Government Efficiency. What's this about? What, what are they expected to do here? I, I keep thinking of Elon Musk rolling into then Twitter headquarters with the sink and, you know, posting, let that sink in. So what are we going to see here? Exactly. Let's just stick with the facts of what we know here, Gotti, if we could. Just in the last few minutes, the Trump campaign put out a press release with three paragraphs outlining that Elon Musk and Vivek Ramaswamy as a pair will be in charge of this new Department of Government Efficiency. Now, exactly how do they create an actual new department and what does that look like? Is there actual staff? Is there a budget behind it? That is not clear. Now, what I can tell you is, is that before the election, Donald Trump was out on the campaign trail, sometimes even with Elon Musk, and was touting the fact that he would put Elon Musk in charge of such a program as this inside of the, the federal government in order to cut potentially $2 trillion out of a $6 trillion annual budget. Elon Musk himself said that Americans would face immediate hardships. And when we're talking about a $6 trillion budget, we're talking about Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, defense spending. A, a, a lot of money is spent by the federal government towards a variety of social programs, but also things like our own U.S. defenses. And so exactly where would they cut? Elon Musk hasn't been specific on that here, but of course, they're going to also have to work with the Republican majorities in the U.S. Congress to pass any such budget. So there's a lot of outstanding question marks as to exactly what this looks like. But Donald Trump so far is going through with his promise to tap these individuals, Elon Musk at the forefront, to go in and become a part of the, his administration in order to go and try to pull off such a feat as this. And these are just a couple of names. Trump also tapping Pete Hegseth, uh, Christy Nome for key positions. What went into these decisions, especially with Hegseth? Pete Hegseth is, is again, I think, objectively a head turner of a decision to lead the Pentagon as the Secretary of Defense. He was a major uh, in the Army National Guard. He is a veteran who served in Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay, and Iraq. He is somebody, though, who has worked for the last many years as a co-host on Fox and Friends Weekend Edition. Uh, he ran a nonprofit organization, advocacy organization for veterans. Uh, Pete uh, Exeth has uh, been a, a, a frequent critic of Democratic administrations on Fox uh, programming and somebody, though, that has remained a close ally to Donald Trump's. Uh, he is, uh, I, I think, that uh, somebody who uh, is n not uh, necessarily uh, an experienced military leader, but somebody who Donald Trump clearly trusts to uh, put into this capacity. You also mentioned Christy Noem, the South Dakota governor, who is going to be uh, the head of the Department of Homeland Security, which includes a broad portfolio from the U.S. Secret Service to the Border Patrol to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Uh, these are uh, some big positions. Uh, uh, Ratcliffe, John Ratcliffe, was just named to be the CIA director. So this was quite the evening for Donald Trump as he fills out his, the top positions of his cabinet and his administration, got it. And Vaughn, we've been hearing rumblings for Secretary of State and the name Marco Rubio. We haven't heard that officially yet, but uh, what are you hearing? And, and can you talk to us about some of the other big announcements we're, we're going to be seeing here in the next few days? Yeah, I think Marco Rubio folks were most likely more familiar with. He is somebody who's been a U.S. senator for more than 10 years now from Florida. He is somebody who is going to satisfy more of the establishment 
uh, in not only Republicans, but also some Democrats up on Capitol Hill in Washington. He was known as being a foreign policy hawk, tough on China, uh, Iran, Cuba. But he has taken a softer position uh, uh, in terms of U.S. Mili military intervention over the course of the last couple of years, falling more in line with Donald Trump's foreign policy uh, agenda, uh, particularly over Russia, Ukraine. And he has suggested openly that potentially Ukraine, in order to end uh, Russia's invasion, will need to come up with a settlement in which they cede some of their land. He, last spring, he voted against more than $80 billion of U.S. supplemental military aid to Ukraine. And so Donald Trump, again, turning to uh, Marco Rubio is somebody who he clearly has grown to trust after eight years ago running against him in that memorable Republican primary in 2016 when the, the two had attentious relationships. But ever since, they've really uh, grown to have a much stronger relationship. A lot of moving parts tonight. Von Hilliard out there in Palm Beach. Thanks so much. An NBC News contributor and former GOP congressman from Florida, Carlos Cabello, is here with us to help break this down. Uh, thanks so much for being with us. We were just talking about Marco Rubio. I know that's still a big question, Mark, but you're from Florida. You've uh, had a lot of dealings with Marco Rubio over the years. What are your thoughts about him for a possible secretary of state? Look, Gotti, uh, early uh, the morning after the election, when Donald Trump came out and said that he wanted to unite the country, Marco Rubio is the type of pick that can actually do that. And we saw that today because he got some plaudits uh, from Democratic senators who said they trusted Rubio and they would be happy to vote for him. So this is the kind of pick that really can unite both sides of the political spectrum. However, it's not official yet. We understand that there are some isolationists in the MAGA movement who have concerns over Rubio, and some of these people are publicly expressing these concerns. So we'll see if he does end up making it. But clearly, Rubio is someone who members of Congress trust and who a lot of policy experts think would bring stability and predictability to Trump's foreign policy. We've heard these rumors for quite some time. We've been expecting the official statement. And instead, we've seen some surprises along the way before that, uh, including this new Department of Government Efficiency, a whole new department. You've served in Congress. You know how slow the government can move. Uh, and you know the inner workings, at least on Capitol Hill, when you hear Vivek and Elon possibly headed to Washington with the big machete to start carving out excess spending, what goes through your mind? So, look, this isn't an actual department. Departments have to be authorized by Congress and funded by Congress. This is essentially a new office in the White House. I mean, these men are going to be important advisors to the president. They're going to review every department, make their recommendations. And I think those recommendations will probably be reflected in the budget that presidents uh, send to Congress around springtime of every year. Now, it's important to note, uh, Gotti, that those budgets are typically ignored by members of Congress from both parties, mm. regardless of who's in the White House. So at the end of the day, if they really do want to slash government spending, they're going to have to go to Congress and get bipartisan majorities to get that done. There's some they can do around the edges through attrition, right, and, and through other methods. But, uh, but not $2 trillion. That would be very difficult for the executive to do unilaterally. To cut $2 trillion, you're going to have to go to Congress and see where they're willing to cut from. It, it does seem like we're headed, though, in to uncharted territory. You've got Vivek, you've got Elon Musk. These are some of the most active kind of, uh, I mean, self-professed edgelords out there. They're very good at bringing publicity with them. And I, I can see like this idea of going in front of buildings or going down hallways and, and trying to find excess waste all streamed live onto Elon Musk's platform. If that happens, if there are these callings for, like, you're fired, you're fired, you're fired, uh, what actually happens in the halls of government uh, when it comes to, like, HR, when it comes to, like, due process? Is it easy to fire somebody that works for the, the government? So, look, like, imagine in the private sector, employees have protections. In the public sector, those protections tend to be even stronger. So I do expect 
Musk and Ramaswamy to draw a lot of attention to this, to perhaps try to influence members of Congress. We've seen them in just recent days trying to influence the vote uh, for Senate Majority Leader tomorrow, right, through social media. And I think you're probably going to see some of those tactics, but they have to be careful. I mean, if employees feel like they're being harassed, mm -hmm. uh, they have legal recourse. Uh, this could really turn into an ugly process if they try to showboat too much around it, if they try to draw too much publicity, it could end up backfiring. It almost sounds like social media coming to life and then ending up in court. Quite uh, possibly. Now, now, when it comes to uh, Pete, Pete Hegseth for Secretary of Defense, that, that is also a very big surprise here. Uh, he has served in Iraq. He's served in Afghanistan. Uh, but what does that tell you about what Trump, President-elect Trump, is looking for in the military? So... Look, loyalty is important to Trump, and I, I don't want to overstate that because I think it's important to every president, but I would say it's more important to Trump than to most presidents, and clearly that's what he's going for here. And I think a Republican Senate majority is going to be fairly deferential to Trump on most cabinet picks. When it comes to defense, when it comes to state, those are really important, and I don't think the president can take the Senate majority for granted. Mm. There are a handful of independent-minded Republican senators serving, and they are going to scrutinize these candidates. So someone like Hegseth, he has to be ready for that Senate confirmation hearing because he can't assume that it's just going to be a cakewalk. And, and not just that Senate confirmation hearing. I mean, the balance of power here. He is tapping people that are serving in Congress, and those seats are going to be vacant for a little bit of time. Well, right? that's a very big deal in the House, God. He, I know NBC News still hasn't projected uh, which party will control the House. It certainly seems like Republicans will, but only by a handful of votes. We already have Elise Stefanik and Mike Waltz leaving the Congress. So Republicans have to be very careful, especially given how ambitious the agenda they're seeking to pursue early in this next term. A bright new world. Carlos, thank you so much for being My with pleasure. us. And after President Trump's victory last week and the Republicans gaining control of the Senate, the party is now eyeing for control of the House, as we were just talking about. And as it stands right now, Republicans hold an advantage of 12, uh, 212 to 204 seats, flipping six in this year's elections. Democrats did flip five seats, but have an uphill battle to gain control of the House. Let's bring in uh, congressional correspondent Julie Serkin to talk a little bit more about the Republicans' momentum. Uh, Julie, thanks for being with us. So uh, in the Senate, in Republican control, in the House close to it, what would a trifecta of power mean for the Trump presidency? Well, it would mean a lot more than Trump had in his first term as president when he didn't have control of full of Congress. He didn't have Republicans loyal uh, without any checks trying to help him push his agenda through. You've heard it time and time and again being described as a mandate. That is definitely what it feels like around here. The vibes are very much that, look, we wrote on Trump's coattails. Now we have to give him everything that he wants. That includes overhauling U.S. tax policy. That includes some really sweeping changes at the southern border and with immigration. That includes, of course, ending federal regulation in some cases and installing the people that he wants to surround himself with in positions of great importance. You can be sure that with a margin of 52, at least in the Senate of Republicans, maybe even 53, when we call that Pennsylvania race, that Trump is going to have a lot of cushion to work with, even with possible defections in the likes of Lisa Murkowski or Susan Collins. On the House side, as you heard from Carlos Corbello, he needs to stop picking off folks for his own cabinet, and that's exactly what we heard from Speaker Johnson today. And what can we expect to see from Democrats when it comes to, to those Trump mandates making their way through Congress? Well, Democrats are going to try to be a check on all of those things, right? It's going to be easier in the House, where presumably, if Republicans do take control, they are working with a very slim margin. Remember what we've seen over the last two years, Gotti? Republicans had just a five-seat majority on Democrats. Democrats were able to splinter the Republican vote in many cases. Now, of course, Republicans were passing largely messaging bills when they had President Biden, a Democrat, in the White House. This time is going to be a little bit different, and certainly having Trump in the White House is going to keep Republicans 
Republicans together a lot more solidly. If he wants something, he can just place a phone call or post on X or Truth Social something angry about a Republican that is standing in the way of his agenda. We saw that time and time again. It even worked when he was out of the White House. Now imagine the power that he has sitting in the Oval Office. And certainly that is something Republicans up here that I'm talking to are well aware of. Yeah, social media bully pulpit. Uh, now, even if they pull off this trifecta, which seems very likely, uh, have we seen a rift in the Republican Party at all? We've seen one in the past. Could, could we see that um, possibly in 2025? Scotty, Republicans just by and large are surprised with the breadth of victory that they've seen on Election Day, especially in the House. Before Election Day, in the months leading up to it, Democrats were all but certain that they'd take control of the lower chamber because of all that chaos and dysfunction that we saw over the last year and a half, especially multiple ballots to get a speaker elected, infighting that started behind closed doors, quickly spread in the public sphere. Mike Johnson, though, the current Republican speaker, has been working really hard to get on the president-elect's good side. He's meeting with him tomorrow. He's going to meet with him later this week, perhaps at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, so he's definitely in Trump's good graces. And certainly there are going to be challengers that come out of the woodworks. For example, the House Freedom Caucus, the very conservative right-wing wing group that has tried to topple speakers in the past from mm -hmm. 2015 onward. They're going to try to challenge Johnson here. But if Trump wants Johnson to stick with the gavel, he'll keep it. And another thing to keep in mind is, is the Supreme Court. If any liberal justices were to step down, how easily could a conservative justice be confirmed by a Republican-controlled con uh, controlled Senate? Here's the thing, Gotti. Every Democrat that I spoke to, including Senator Durbin today, who's in charge of the Judiciary Committee, at least for now, the top Democrat on that panel, said any uh, any rumors, he called it, of Sonia Sotomayor stepping down or resigning are unfounded. So far, no Democrats I spoke to are making that push for it to happen. But Trump got a lot of justices on that court. I covered the hearings when uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away and Amy Coney Barrett filled her spot with the shortest one of the shortest confirmation processes ever. It lasted about three weeks. So from a timeline perspective, Democrats would have time if Sonia, Sonia, if Sonia Sotomayor uh, left the court, excuse me, but by all accounts, that's just a rumor at this point. Julie Serkin, thank you. And in keeping with tradition, President Biden and President-elect Trump are expected to meet at the White House tomorrow morning. And this will be the first time those two men will meet since that presidential debate, which eventually led to Biden dropping out of the race. NBC's Dasha Burns has more. So this meeting between President Biden and President-elect Donald Trump, this is part of a long-standing tradition, a courtesy that is typically extended by the sitting president to the president-elect. But it is a courtesy that was not extended to then-president-elect Biden by then-president Trump in 2020. Uh, he did not concede the election and therefore did not invite Biden to the White House. Before that, though, President Obama did invite then-president-elect Trump. Their meeting lasted about uh, 90 minutes and was cordial and productive, according to then-President Obama. Another piece of this that typically happens is uh, the First Lady and the incoming First Lady often meet as well. It does not sound like, as of now, that Melania Trump will be participating in that. Also, J.D. Vance, uh, the pres vice president-elect and Vice President Kamala Harris, as of now, uh, also are not planning to meet either, though, again, we're still waiting to find out some of those details. But right now, it looks like we've got President Biden, uh, President-elect Trump, and clearly there is a lot going on in the world, a lot going on in the country that they are going to need to discuss. We also know that the staffs, uh, senior staff for both uh, President Biden and President-elect Trump will also meet as we are constantly in this flurry of keeping up with the transition, all of the names that are being floated, and watching as the small smooth transition of power, which is so key to our democracy, plays out in front of our eyes. We're looking forward to hearing more how that conversation plays out. Dasha Burns, thanks so much. And turning now to the president-elect's ongoing legal drama. Today, a New York judge overseeing the hush money case delayed a key ruling for another week. This all stems from those 34 felony convictions for hush money payments to porn film star Stormy Daniels. Now that uh, the president-elect has been re-elected, Trump's legal team wants that case dismissed entirely, while the prosecution is saying it needs more time to evaluate their next steps. 
Judge Mershon agreed to give them another week, but as of now, Trump's still slated to be sentenced two weeks from today. That is November 26th. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalas. Uh, Danny, real talk here. Like, this is now the president-elect. Are all of these cases destined to go nowhere now that he's headed back to the White House? My prediction is Donald Trump is now going to go 4-0 and on these cases. In other words, even though he's been convicted in New York, I think there's a strong pro probability that that case may go away, too. At least the guilty verdict may disintegrate if the judge, for example, throws the case out, which, by the way, I don't think it's a sure thing. And the part about this that really surprises me is that the prosecution is even willing to delay one week, even though, look, a week isn't all that long. The prosecution, and by this I mean the Manhattan DA's office in this case, uh, I would think would be arguing the entire way that this case has nothing to do with the immunity decision whatsoever. And they have argued that. I am surprised that they, they wanted a uh, delay of a week. Uh, but then again, a week isn't all that long, and maybe they really do need time to think about what they want to do. But for the Manhattan DA's office, it's not like the federal cases where they have to think about what they want to do, because Donald Trump can't make the Manhattan DA's case go away the way he can with the federal cases. So the Manhattan DA's office is in a much better position than Jack Smith and the special counsel team. I'm so glad you brought up immunity because I'm still trying to wrap my head around what immunity even means in this day and age. So can you remind us again how the, the argument of presidential immunity is in play here when it comes to, to these certain pieces of evidence that the jury already saw? Right. And you seized on the key issue. What this case is not about, it is not about whether or not repaying Michael Cohen for his payments to a porn star to keep quiet, whether or not those are official presidential acts, because obviously they're not. Instead, it's more nuanced. The defense is essentially arguing that the immunity decision not only immunizes a former president, it also prevents certain evidence from coming in from his time in the White House in a prosecution. And what the defense is arguing is that when the people of the state of New York called people like Madeleine Westerhout, who was Trump's assistant in the White House, or Hope Hicks, or they bring in evidence from his time in the White House, it is that evidence that violates the immunity decision. It's not the case that Trump is immune for payments he made to a, a, a porn star or that Michael Cohen made to a porn star before Trump was in office. Rather, it's the evidence that may have been improper against him. And that may result in the guilty verdict being vacated. Uh, such a distinction in this cloud of confusion. Danny Savalos, thank you so much for keeping us straight there. We are learning that three U.S. flights have now been hit by gunfire in Haiti. That's prompted the FAA to order airlines not to fly to the Haitian capital, Port-au-Prince. NBC News senior correspondent Tom Costello has the latest. Hey, Gotti, so all three of these flights uh, happened on Monday, but the American Airlines flight that we learned about today, they didn't discover that they had uh, a damage and, and a bullet hole to the fuselage or to the plane until today when they did a full inspection in Miami. So that plane, that American Airlines plane, was leaving Port-au-Prince, flying to Miami, apparently hit by gunfire, and landed safely yesterday uh, in Miami. Also, JetBlue announced that it had a plane leaving Port-au-Prince headed for JFK Airport in New York. Once it was on the ground, they inspected it. Sure enough, it had signs of gunfire uh, on the fuselage or on the wing. And then, of course, that Spirit Airlines flight that we all became aware of because of the video and the photos, that plane was coming into Port-au-Prince and, of course, hit by gunfire that raked and apparently penetrated into the, the passenger cabin. Thankfully, miraculously, nobody inside was hit by gunfire. One flight attendant did have a minor wound. We think that she was hit by some flying fiberglass when the bullet actually hit a piece of fiberglass, but she's okay. Bottom line, because of this gunfire, the FAA has now acted, putting in place a 30-day order that no U.S. carrier can fly into, out of, or below 10,000 feet over Haiti. So if you're flying over Haiti, over 10,000 feet, that's fine. Nobody's going into or out of right now uh, Haiti, with the exception of emergency aid, uh, relief efforts, and that kind of thing. Uh, and I think now we have to ask ourselves, 
Whereas maybe the first and maybe the second, you could have thought, okay, maybe the planes were in the wrong place at the wrong time, flying over a hot zone when you've got these rival gangs down below shooting at each other. Maybe they just got in the wrong place. But when you've got three commercial carriers all hit on the same day, I think you have to wonder whether this is intentional. And, of course, the situation on the ground in Haiti is very, very unstable. It is absolute anarchy in much of the country. 85% of Port-au-Prince is not being controlled by what little government there is. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, being controlled by rival gangs, very heavily armed rival gangs. There is a 400-man a Kenyan police detachment on the ground in Haiti. It has been assigned by the UN to try to stabilize the country, or at least stabilize Port-au-Prince, they are outmanned, outgunned, and outspent. Uh, and so they're calling for reinforcements from other countries to help. They're calling for more money. It is a volatile, dangerous situation on the ground. And as you know, the State Department has for five years been warning that this is a level four country, do not fly country. The State Department reiterated that in September, saying do not fly into Haiti. It's dangerous, especially around the airport. And then again today, reiterating that order. And now the FAA, of course, has said no flights can go into, out of, or, or, or through Haitian airspace below 10,000 feet. This is a very dangerous, volatile situation, made even more desperate for the people on the ground who are literally uh, struggling to survive day in and day out amid this gang violence, awful bloodshed, no, very little to eat, no chances to improve one's life. Uh, and so now U.S. carriers have decided they're not going in, and the FAA has ordered no flights are going to go in. So it's a changing situation. We'll watch closely. Gotti? But a very understandable decision there. Tom Costello, thank you. Don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, an explosion in Louisville, Kentucky, has left at least 11 people hurt. Officials there are calling it a hazardous material incident. Plus, we're going to bring you the latest on those massive wildfires burning on both coasts, causing a huge headache for commuters in New Jersey tonight. And later this hour, new data is showing more Americans are taking breaks from their streaming subscriptions. Not canceling them, but just taking a little break. We're going to tell you more about that in tonight's Future of Everything. have a Disney Plus account and a Hulu account and a Netflix account and a Paramount Plus and a Peacock account. Having all these things and a YouTube Plus. You are wasting money. There is not enough time. Hey there, welcome back. And here are some of the other headlines we're watching tonight. Democrat Ruben Gallego has won the Arizona Senate race, beating Republican Carrie Lake. The current Arizona congressman becomes the first a Hispanic senator in that state, and Gallego was in Washington for Senate orientation today. He met with current Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and other incoming senators. Now, the Supreme Court says they won't hear Mark Meadows' appeal in the Georgia election interference case. Trump's former chief of staff tried to move the case to federal court, basically arguing he acted as a federal official, and Meadows is facing two counts related to his efforts to keep Trump in power back in 2020. He has pleaded not guilty to those charges. And Louisiana public schools won't be required to display the Ten Commandments after all, after a federal ruling. The state law was supposed to go into effect in January. A bunch of parents sued to stop it. The judge calling the law unconstitutional. Louisiana's AG says they will appeal immediately. And the Pentagon docks leaker was sentenced today to 15 years in federal prison. Jack Tashira was behind one of the most high-profile leaks in U.S. history. He violated the Espionage Act when he leaked highly classified military documents related to the war in Ukraine, and he pleaded guilty back in March after being arrested last year. And Netflix is touting the growth of its ad-supported model, saying it now has 70 million monthly users. That is up from just 40 million in May. They launched that ad model two years ago, basically as a cheaper tier to try and keep subscribers. And we are following some breaking news out of Louisville, Kentucky. A commercial building ripped open by an explosion. A camera from our NBC affiliate appeared to capture the moment of that blast that sent at least 11 people to the hospital. A shelter-in-place order has just been lifted for the immediate area. And let's bring in NBC News correspondent Mara Barrett, who's been following this. Mara, it seems like a lot of people were actually inside that building when it blew up. What do we know about the explosion? 
Yeah, Gotti, this all happened as a loud boom echoed across the entire city of Louisville. And this is something that we saw reports from businesses as far as a mile away also feeling that shock, their storefronts blowing out from the explosion. The building where we know the explosion happened is uh, it's part of a strip of manufacturing plants in that part of Louisville. The building specifically deals with manufacturing uh, natural food dye colors. Uh, and so it's unclear what caused the explosion still at this hour, as well as if or any chemicals were involved. I'm going to hear from one of the residents in a nearby neighborhood who kind of described exactly what he heard and saw at the time. I live about a mile away from here, and I was just inside of my house and heard a huge boom, and the whole house shook. Um, the power went off for a couple of seconds. Now, back in 2003, we've learned a similar explosion actually killed a worker uh, back in April of 2023, and a later federal investigation found that the incident was preventable, and so investigators are clearly uh, going to be looking back at that, seeing any connection there potentially, uh, but we do know from the mayor and other police officials that anybody that was inside or, or close or associated with the building, with the manufacturer, uh, has been accounted for, so there is good news in that sense, Gotti. Yeah, yeah, we had heard about people possibly being trapped in the building. What, were there people trapped after that explosion, or was everybody able to make it out? At one point, there was at least one person trapped. I actually wanted to hear from one of the fire officials who described that, uh, that portion of the incident. We had one person that was pinned. We were able to get them out, rescue them, as well as assist the others in evacuation. And so EMS, fire officials, police all on scene very quickly able to help evacuate uh, people from the building and the surrounding several blocks. Uh, that person who was pinned transported uh, to, to the hospital along with it, in total about 11 people uh, transported. We know that two are in critical condition. Uh, one of the hospitals that received about half of the patients said that all of those patients they were treating, about six or seven of them, had been decontaminated before they were treated. And they're mainly treating uh, burn injuries as well as crush injuries from debris that had fallen from overhead. And so doctors are looking uh, for uh, potential brain injuries. They do say, though, that there's no significant bleeding from any of the patients. And so uh, that's a hopeful sign, doctors say. But they did commend uh, first responders for treating the folks on site uh, before getting them to the hospital for further care. And Mara, I know that investigations take some time, but given the history there and, and given the, the nature of what they make, is there any idea of what caused this explosion? They're, they basically told, the officials told reporters uh, shortly after the incident, they're looking into potential chemicals. They don't know what other type of hazardous uh, gas or, or materials could be in the area. They actually noted, and this it was very interesting, they're using new technology, a gas sensor attachment to drones that they're flying around the area to make sure that they're detecting anything that could be dangerous for residents. And at that time, granted this was a few hours ago, we haven't gotten an update since, but at that time there were no hazardous uh, gas or chemicals uh, in the air. And so that evacuation, that shelter in place uh, order that was originally put into place was out of an abundance of caution, but officials are very much still actively investigating this and will be following if there's any more details on if there were any or what types of chemicals involved. Yeah, what a novel use of drones there. Mara Barrett, thank you. And another day of dangerously dry and windy conditions making it tough to get wildfires under control from coast to coast. In Southern California here, the mountain fire has now destroyed more than 200 structures, burning more than 20,000 acres in Ventura County. It is only 48 percent contained. But the big story remains in the Northeast. 35 million people from Maine to Maryland are under red flag warnings or elevated fire risks. Even travel is starting to be impacted. Amtrak train service between New York City to Connecticut. That's suspended for the rest of the day because of a fire. Videos from the Citizen app show some of the flames from earlier. A New York's governor announcing a statewide burn ban as the Jennings Creek wildfire burns across both New York and New Jersey. That one is only 20 percent contained. And adding to the concerns, nearly 60 percent of the Northeast is dealing with drought conditions. That is a level we haven't seen in decades. Some leaders are urging people to cut back on long showers and, and to use their washing machines or dishwashers. NBC's Antonia Hilton has the latest tonight from Brooklyn. Antonia? Hey, Gotti, these are historic and really dangerous drought conditions. And a number of factors are leading to all of this. Very low humidity, 
dry leaves blanketing the ground in this entire region, very little precipitation. Back on Sunday, we got just a little bit of rain, but we don't see much coming in the forecast. And experts say that what we got this past weekend was nowhere near enough to stop all of this. Here in Brooklyn, a fire raged here at Prospect Park throughout the weekend. And not only has it caused damage that officials say is going to take years to recover from, but it also impacted the air quality for millions. The thing people are most concerned about right now, the fire that is raging on the border between New York and New Jersey, the Jennings Creek wildfire, that one has attracted dozens of fire departments and agencies that are trying to fight this thing from the ground and the skies. And it has spread from about 3,500 acres to 5,000 acres. In order to protect yourself and your community, there are a few things officials are urging people to pay attention to right now. Now is not the time to take out power tools that could spark in your backyard and use them. There are burn bans now in effect, like here in New York. That means you can't go to parks and burn trash or have your grill out and celebrate with your friends this coming weekend. All of those extra steps need to be taken because these are highly unusual conditions, unlike anything we've seen since about 2002, according to experts here, Gotti. Antonia, thank you. Let's bring in NBC News meteorologist Bill Karens. Bill, is the rain the only saving grace right now with these wildfires? And the Northeast, I mean, it's getting so late in the season, maybe snow. Uh, we need something, uh, but it's not in the cards. And tomorrow, the elevated fire risk continues. It, you know, the winds are died down. It's going to happen again, though, when the sun comes up, it's going to mix the air. The winds are going to pick up. And so during the daylight hours tomorrow from D.C. all the way to southern New England, that's going to be the concern. And they're not going to be as windy as today. Today got really gusty, 30 to 40 mile per hour gusts. We're more in the 20 to 30 range, the exception Boston and out on Cape Cod. So for the fires that are out there, the firefighters left have to you know, be out there trying to get containment. And if any new fires form, they would be able to spread pretty rapidly. And we keep showing this graphic day after day, Gotti. Zero predicted rainfall in the next seven days. All these dry areas in the northeast. Uh, those double zeros are so scary. Meanwhile, in the Pacific Northwest, it's like op the opposite, right? They have too much rain from some of these storms, right? Yeah, there will be some areas that'll get a lot. The rivers are going to do okay since this is the first significant storm. And by the way, this ends the fire season. So we do have high winds coming into the coastal areas too. And there shouldn't be too much damage. We're looking at wind gusts maybe 50 to 70 miles per hour. Uh, higher elevations, of course, will get the worst of that. But the rain has really picked up now up I-5 mm. from Portland. Soon it will be up in the Seattle area. And so uh, this is a warm storm. So there will be some snow, but it's going to be at the highest of elevations. So as we go throughout the evening, we push that on shore. Notice that we will get some rain from about San Francisco northwards, but San Francisco southwards, you're out of luck. That's where the fire season continues from just about central California southwards. This is the rainfall forecast here. So Fresno, L.A., uh, everyone here down along the coast, no chance of rain. It's all going to be from Ukiah, Crescent City northwards. And as far as snowfall goes, same thing, highest of elevations. This isn't a big, huge snowstorm even for the ski areas. And I hate to say it, but there's something else brewing in the tropics, right? I'm already worried about my uh, next week. They, uh, like, yeah, we could have a Santa Ana wind event in Southern California next week. We could have a possible hurricane to watch. I mean, what else are we going to throw at us? So it's, you know, we still are in the hurricane season. It goes to the end of November. It's not unheard of to get storms this late in the season, but it is kind of unheard of to get strong storms. So we have a 90% chance of development. Right now, it's going to be heading near Jamaica tonight. It looks like it's going to be somewhere near Nicaragua and Honduras as we go throughout the weekend. And then after that, all of our major computer models take it towards, you know, Mexico. Mexico, Cancun here, possibly towards uh, Cozumel. And then by a week from now, so this is a long ways away. This is seven days from now. It should be somewhere in the southern Gulf of Mexico. And then it does appear heading towards Florida. We don't know at what strength or intensity. You know, maybe it's Cuba and not Florida. But at least the potential is there, Gotti. We could have a serious storm situation next week as we head towards the middle of November. Not what Florida residents want to hear at all. Not at all. Bill Karens, thank you. And coming up, California is a notoriously blue state, right? Well, this election showed things might be shifting red in some of the most liberal places. We're going to have more on that right after the break. But first, you got to see this. A German slackliners, they were out and about, and they set an insane world record by walking the slack line between two hot air balloons soaring over 8,200 feet in the air. They beat the previous record by almost 2,000 feet. Ha! Huh. Some slackers get to have all the fun. We'll be right back.
Hey, welcome back. When it comes to California and politics in a presidential election year, things are usually pretty predictable. This year, not so much. The latest twist came last night when Democrats officially flipped a red seat blue in California's 27th district. George uh, Whiteside beat incumbent Mike Garcia. I know, right? Big shocker. But the actual shocker for Democrats is what else is happening in California in a very big way. A shift to the right all the way across the state. Look at these maps. County by county, this election is clearly a very different shade than 2020. Even candidates in California's most liberal cities were not immune to the conservative shift. It is historic. Both Alameda County District Attorney Pamela Price and Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao appear headed for recall. In San Francisco, Mayor London Breed is out after conceding to Daniel Lurie. Our mandate is to show how government must deliver on its promises, clean and safe streets for all. The latest numbers in the race for L.A. District Attorney Nathan Hockman with 62 percent. Turns out that safety is a crossover issue in our political environment. Here's what I'm here to tell the police department. Your hands aren't tied anymore. And it looks like a lot of it was fueled by the issue of crime. Voters overwhelmingly passing a statewide anti-crime ballot measure. Prop six, uh, 36, as we call it here. On the flip side, liberal-leaning proposals like raising the minimum wage, a ban on forced prison labor, and rent control either failed or are pretty likely to fail. And the top Republican in the state assembly tweeting his reaction to the results. Quote, the shift is beginning, he says. Joining us now to dive into why all this is happening is Conan Nolan, chief political reporter for NBC LA, and Chris Caladego, California bureau chief at Politico. Welcome to you both. Uh, so first question here, is California's political shift a temporary blip for Democrats, or are Republicans truly making a comeback, but like in the late 60s to, to 80s. Conan, let's start with you. Uh, we, we shall see. Um, <laughs> for, you know, for context, four years ago, Joe Biden won this state by 5 million votes. Kamala Harris, a native-born California, by the way, is leading by just over 2.5 million. So, uh, yeah, uh, there was better Republican turnout in this uh, state. Plus, those ballot measures you mentioned, the one that got tough on, uh, on criminal justice, they passed by a 70-30 margin. 70% of the voters mm -hmm. supported Prop 36. So, uh, yes, it was a more conservative. It was, a, a, it was an angered electorate, I think, in California, particularly over the issue of crime and punishment. Uh, and that's what drove, I think, so many of those red counties that you saw on that map. Yeah, the, the counties and also, I mean, the DA races in L.A., Oakland as well, the San Francisco mayoral race. Uh, I guess, Chris, how much ground have Democrats lost when it comes to crime here? There's been a real loss, particularly coming out of uh, ground for Democrats, particularly coming out of COVID. I mean, you see people who are they're tired of seeing either lumping in the issue of homelessness, which we know has been a, a big issue in California. They're tired of seeing these tent encampments. They're tired of seeing the deodorant and the shampoo locked behind uh, plastic at the at the drugstore. And I think this was a real way for them to vent in a very democratic state uh, where they don't feel like uh, Democrats have always listened to them. Um, but I would say this was even more of a back to the basics election where uh, these folks you saw thrown out in the East Bay out of office and you saw the San Francisco's mayor's race. People want government to get back to the basics, to deliver on some of these things that they expected the government to deliver on. Oakland, obviously crime, a big issue there. Homelessness in San Francisco, people very fed up about that. Um, and even in L.A., this was, you know, sure it was about George Gascon, the incumbent's um, ideology and the fact that people didn't feel like he was prosecuting enough folks, but it was also about competence. And his opponent in that race really drilled down on him, on Gasco, not being up to the task, not being able to run that office. And so this was kind of a back to the basics. And just one small warning that I should mention is a lot of votes are still coming in. So while the map might look a little more red right now, um, than, it, than it normally does, and it may end up being more red than it has in past elections. Uh, still a few million votes coming in. So some of these areas will shade in a little bit more blue, but uh, a terrible election for incumbents. We saw Congressman Robert Garcia from California's 42nd. He was on Meet the Press uh, Now today, and here's what he has had to say about Democrats moving forward. I want to get your guys' take after this. 
Do you agree that the Democratic Party needs to be wholly rebuilt? And what does that practically look like? Overall, I think our party has and will continue to be the party of working people. It's a party of reproductive health care. It's a party of lowering costs. It's a party of unions. It's a party that has supported uh, students and working class people. I think those are things that we should be proud of, that we should continue to fight and push for. Um, but absolutely, I think as far as where we're messaging those things, I think we've got to do a better job at. So, Conan, you've been watching these things evolve for years. Is this about messaging and working on messaging, or is this about policy and changing policy? Let me give you an example of why it's about policy, Gotti. On Friday, with everybody's attention uh, paid to the election, the, the California Air Resources Board, a very powerful agency, uh, passed new measures on refineries that their own staff report said could result in a 47 cent per gallon increase in the cost of gas next year. That was a shock. They wow. came back and said, well, maybe it's 10 cents. Uh, well, we're not sure. Even the Democratic leadership in the California legislature is saying, well, wait a second. So, no, it's not messaging. It's about policy. And remember, we talked about the ballot measure that changed uh, criminal justice in California. Gavin Newsom was opposed to it. The attorney general, Rob Bonta, was opposed to it. The legislative Democratic leadership, they were opposed to it. They were out of touch with the voters of this state. So, yeah, I think there's awakening, and it's not just about messaging. Uh, Conan, this makes me miss a time when I, we, we used to sit next to each other and I learned more about <laughs> politics, more about California, uh, just eavesdropping, you, you talking on the phone than anybody else. I, I miss those days. I'm going to have to come uh, listen to the phone calls happening at your desk. Um, You're very I, sweet. I mean, yeah, these, these very popular liberal policies, rent control, minimum wage, it doesn't look like they were actually that popular. So, so Chris, any take on why that is? Yeah, I remember this is the third time that uh, rent control has gone down. The same proponents have run the same measure, uh, a very similar measure, three times in a row now. And you have a uh, landlord's lobby that is very powerful and has a lot of money and is, has shut this down each time. Um, and then, you know, even going back to the issue of uh, of gas prices and, and these climate policies, they're at the center of California now for, for well over a decade. This is when the, the bill comes due. These are the types of things that Californians are now seeing, the costs that they're going to have to bear for these policies, which are clearly going to be uh, uh, completely on the opposite end of what we're going to see in, in Washington under a second Trump administration. And so the question really becomes on that same night, we saw people pass, a, uh, Californians pass a huge climate bond. So Californians continue to say that they're for these climate change policies. But as we start to see the costs of energy go up, as we start to see the costs of, uh, of gas go up, uh, even uh, things like property insurance go up because of fires, uh, people are starting to have to pay for these things, and that's going to be a really big test of how much they want the state to continue with these types of policies. Chris Caldego and Conan Nolan, so many fascinating points. Thank you both so much. And straight ahead, world agencies are sounding the alarm on Gaza, saying it's on the brink of famine right now. And NBC's Richard Engel joined the Jordanian Air Force as they delivered critical supplies to people in Gaza. That's coming right up after the break. Eight tons of food and medicine, this time being dropped over southern Gaza. Hey, welcome back. The World Health Organization is warning that Gaza is at risk of imminent famine. The U.N. is saying that very few aid trucks are being let into the Strip, roughly about 30 a day in recent weeks. But countries and organizations are still doing what they can to try to get food and medical supplies to the people in need. NBC's chief international correspondent Richard Engel joined the Royal Jordanian Air Force on one of those life-saving missions. Outside of Amman, we boarded a Jordanian military C-130 cargo plane bound for Gaza. The crates it's carrying are full of some of the only food getting to 2.2 million Gazans. A month ago, the Biden administration gave Israel a clear ultimatum to allow in more aid by truck by tonight, or else U.S. military support could be reduced. But today, the U.S. announced Israel has taken positive steps and will not withhold military aid for now. 
we've seen some uh, progress being made. We would like to see uh, some more changes happen. The UN and humanitarian groups do not agree, saying too little has changed, making these rare airdrops all the more critical. And there they go, eight tons of food and medicine, this time being dropped over southern Gaza. Our crew filmed crowds in Gaza grow excited as they watched the chutes open. Soon, they were off running, desperate to get whatever they could before it was gone. But 30-year-old Abdullah Maruf came back with an empty bag. It was a bust, he says. He explains another Palestinian family got to the aid first and fired guns in the air to keep everything for themselves. Law and order have broken down in Gaza after a year of war and siege. So Abdullah went back to his tent to tell his wife and four children they'll have no food tonight. Israel insists it is allowing more aid in and blames the U.N. for failing to distribute it. The U.N. warns that parts of Gaza are once again on the brink of famine. When well, that's going to do it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you here tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned out. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.